Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's Data Bytes, Getting Things Done with Data in Government. I'm Gavin Freegard, Associate at the Institute for Government, and it's wonderful to welcome so many of you to this, our first Data Bytes of 2021. We'll start in the traditional way. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. And hands up if this is your first Data Bytes. Welcome. You've picked a great one to start with. Tonight's Data Bytes comes after the longest January in recorded history and is our 16th edition. Just to mess with your sense of time, tonight's event means we've held as many data bytes online as we ever did in the Institute for Government Building. And to add to your sense of temporal confusion, yesterday was Groundhog Day, immortalised by the film where someone lives the same day over and over again. Something none of us can relate to, I'm sure. Of course, you're not living the same data bytes over and over again. It just feels like it, given the quality of the jokes. As with all other data bytes events, we'll start with some housekeeping. Tonight's event is on the record and we're being live streamed, obviously. If you'd like to get in on the social media action, use hashtag IFG data bytes and you can follow us live tweeting at IFG events. And if you'd like me to put your questions to any of our speakers tonight, I'd encourage you to use Slido. That's a case sensitive link, bit.ly slash Slido DB16, capital S, capital DB. But you can also use hashtag IFG data bytes on Twitter or drop something into the chat on YouTube. You may already be wondering why you're here tonight. Well, Data Bytes is here to bring the various different communities working on data in government together, to show everyone what better data can mean for them, and to put some great projects on the record for us all to learn from. If you're wondering how it works, well, tonight you'll be treated to four presentations on data in government. Each presentation will last for eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes. The time is hopefully on screen. There are eight bits in a byte, hence eight minutes in a data byte. And that will be followed by eight minutes. Yes, eight minutes where I put your questions to the speaker. We then move on to the next speaker. So four eight minute presentations, each followed by eight minutes of Q&A. You can find the previous 15 events at bit.ly slash IFG data bytes. Those are our wonderful speakers from December. It feels like a long time since we last met, a very long time. England was yet to enter a third national lockdown. Donald Trump was still president of the United States. And the day of our December data bite saw the approval of the first coronavirus vaccine for use in the UK. So there has been some good news. The government has set itself a target of 15 million vaccinations offered by mid-February, the dark dotted line on screen. And if we have a look at the blue line of vaccinations offered so far, you can see that like the great John Bon Jovi, we're halfway there cheering facts and figures. And if you like facts and figures about UK government, then last week was chart Christmas with the release of Whitehall Monitor 2021. Lots of old favourites in there. What's happened to civil service staff numbers, the absolute state of the economy, our famous ministerial resignations chart. So wide ranging is this year's Whitehall Monitor, it even includes a good news story about government transparency. This is showing you the gap between meetings of SAGE, the government scientific advisory group for emergencies, and their minutes being published. Up until June, there was quite a lag. Those pink bars show delays of more than a month. But since then, it's been much better. Look at those shorter grey bars. There's loads more in the report. You can find it on the IFG website or watch the launch event with my colleague Tim as your expert guide to some of the most salient statistics and eye-catching charts. Now, over the last month, social media has been awash with the story of people waiting for an elusive hero to arrive and rescue them from a suboptimal situation. Yes, the government announced some new details about its chief data officer, although it's not quite what we were expecting. Back in 2017, government said it would appoint a CDO. Then in 2019, it said it would also appoint a CDIO. Neither role was filled. Last autumn, government said it was going to appoint a CDO, a CDO and a CEO of GDS. It initially said the GDS CEO would report to the CDO and the CDO would lead DDAT, but then quietly changed it such that the CDO would take on those responsibilities. In January, the CDIO at MOJ became the new CEO of GDS, and instead of appointing a CDO or a CDO, the government instead created a CDDO to fulfil the function of the CDO and lead DDAT, because the CDO they wanted to appoint was happy as CDA at LEGO, so now he's chair of the CDDO. The HO CDIO becomes the CDDO ED, reporting to the COO for the CS at the CO, and CDDO will soon appoint a CDO. Okay? Government has promised some further detail on the CDDO, and I'd argue that we still need to understand how exactly it, GDS, and the TBA CDO will all fit together. But those are just some initial thoughts. So when will the Chief Data Officer come? 
Those of you who've been to Data Bytes before will know that I have some history of setting data to music. Check out the link on screen later if you're unfamiliar. So I know the question you're asking is, shall Gavin attempt to do something musical with this or shan't he? Well, there once was a national data strategy to skill up civil servants and fix legacy IT and business and society. It's not just for the nerds, all 30,000 words. Soon will the chief data officer come to all government data architecture replumb. But should the momentum be run around again, we'll go. Brexit's done, so the next question is what's going to happen to data protection? Adequate, inadequate, who knows how far they'll change GDPR. Soon will the chief data officer come to all government data architecture replumb. But should the momentum be run around again, we'll go. The strategy's delivered, it's no longer hypothetical, but questions remain like, will data use be ethical? Will it be successful in terms practical, political? Only the future knows. Soon will the chief data officer come to all government data architecture replumb. Let's try some optimism, let's see how it goes. Well, uh, man, look out for my forthcoming album of sea shanties on niche government data issues including the question everyone at Ofqual is asking after the A-level algorithm episode and now the departure of their chair. What shall we do after Roger Taylor? To the business of the evening and a particularly brilliant lineup to start the Data Bytes year. First, we'll hear from Indra Joshi, Director of Artificial Intelligence at NHSX on the work of the NHS AI Lab. Then we'll hear from James Tucker, Head of the Government Data Quality Hub on working towards a data quality culture. Our third speaker is Lisa Allen, Head of Data and Analytical Services at Ordnance Survey, on taking a principles approach to data. And last but not least, we have our second James of the evening, James Coote, our first speaker ever from the 10 Downing Street Data Science Unit on the Data Masterclass for Senior Leaders. Some dates for your diary. We'll be back with you on Wednesday, 3rd of March, and you can pencil in the first Wednesday of each month up to the 7th of July. We've got some fantastic people and projects lined up for you to hear from. We will, however, only be able to keep Data Bytes going with the support of sponsors. If you'd like to see your name up here in lights and the opportunity to talk about your work, please drop my colleague Pratesh an email. And if you're interested in speaking or know someone who should be, please get in touch with me. As ever, we'll be having some virtual drinks after tonight's event. I'll put these details up again at the end, but the case sensitive link is bit.ly slash db16 drinks and the password is ifgdb16. So to our first Data Bytes presenter in 2021, Dr. Indra Joshi. Indra, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Gavin. And how am I ever going to follow a Sea Shanties uh, video like that? I feel terribly guilty that I don't actually have a song now to sing. So hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. This is really exciting. My first Data Bytes as well. So new to the scene and really excited to hear from everyone else. Um, as with all people who care for others at home, I make the caveat that my children may pop in any minute um, and I will apologise in advance if I lose track of any conversations. So a little very quick overview of the NHS AI Lab and um, what we're trying to achieve with it. Now, with all things, it's so hard to kind of say so much of what it is in about eight minutes. So I'm going to present some slides and hopefully you can see them. Gavin, if you could just give me a thumbs up. Perfect. So let's get that in full screen. So um, if anybody would like to hear a little bit more about what's going on or read a bit more or even join our virtual AI hub, unfortunately, during the pandemic, we had this big vision that we would set up an actual lab, like an actual building where people could come in, they could see tech, they could understand what it actually could do for both patients and citizens. However, as with many things, that's not possible. So we've set up a virtual hub online um, and all the details are found in that link there on the NHSX website. So really briefly, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the different programmes that underpin the AI lab. Now, the whole point was of the lab was it's a series of funding programmes and the essence is to accelerate both the development and deployment of AI into health and care. 
Now, as with all things AI, it's very difficult just to say there it is. And what we need to do is create what we call an ecosystem or various strands of work to both enable product development, deployment into care settings, but also ensure that we get the frameworks right. And what I mean by the frameworks are the rules, the regulations and the various standards in this place. And so we've set up this lab with all these various programmes underneath it. The AI and Health and Care Award is our flagship programme where we've put 140 million behind this over three years to, in essence, kickstart and also deploy products into the front line. On the website I gave earlier, you'll see that this year um, we've already funded 42 um, products. Uh, a number are in the early stage and research stage. And then we have 10 which are ready made and are already out there in the health and care system. And to give you a bit of a flavour, we've got products such as Healthy IO, which is about remote diagnosing and uh, monitoring um, kidney disease, all the way up to predictive analytics and predictive programmes that look at people flowing through um, the intensive care unit. The next programme, so the award is all about products and trying to get them into the system. And then on the flip side, we want to talk about Skunk Works, which is about problems. And I'll come on to that a bit later. This third programme we have is around regulations. We talked about this. AI regulations, especially in health and care, are very important. Understanding both consent and privacy issues, how to access data, how to then ensure that data is both proportionate and relevant to what you're developing, and then how to ensure that once it's deployed in the system, what we call post-market surveillance continues. And so we work with a number of the regulatory programmes, both MHRA, CQC um, and and NICE, who look at evaluation of products and systems. I'm going to skip to the next slide just to talk a little bit about um, this is about data and government. So some of uh, a programme that we've already set up called the National COVID Chest Image Database. And here, essentially, we during the pandemic, we had a lot of companies come to us and say, we really want to help you with our products. And so we set up this database, which looks at images across different modalities to try and help us better understand that spread of COVID throughout the body, but also identify it a bit earlier. I mentioned Skunk Works and just a very brief overview here. We've got the very exciting Giuseppe lined up to come and talk to you in a future Data Bytes um, event, so I won't give away too much. But essentially, Giuseppe is setting up a small team which is going to solve problems out there. It's not looking necessarily at products, but much more problems. And can data and health and care help you solve that problem? So I've put the little um, email there. If you are working, if you are an arm's length body, you're in government looking at problems in health and care, do drop them a line. Um, they're doing a Dragon's Den, which is essentially a big pitch fest over the next few weeks. So we are looking for problems to solve. And then lastly, I talked about making sure that you really follow the rules. I talked a bit about the regulations and the work we're doing with the regulators. But the other really important thing that the lab is looking at is about the ethics and ensuring that all of the work we do is responsible and covers all the different bases. So we've partnered with these institutes below, the Health Foundation, Health Education England, the Ada Lovelace Institute, to ensure that some of our products, we really try and um, embed those different principles, such as algorithmic impact assessments, and ensure that we're really um, making sure people look at representative data when they're training these different areas. And again, another exciting programme of work, which I hope Data Bytes will see a bit more information on. So there is a super whistle stop tour um, of what the AI lab does, what we're trying to do. If you're interested to hear a bit more, do reach out to us. We're always excited. As I said, we've got our virtual hub where we do a series of webinars and events as well for more specific areas, because I'm always conscious eight minutes is an incredibly short amount of time to give a large overview of different programmes. So Gavin, I hope I have kept to time and I will hand it back over. Thank you very much, Indra. In fact, I think that might be a data bytes record. I think that was more like six minutes. That's extraordinary to cover that much um, in such a short space of time. Thank you very much indeed. And as you say, we're very much looking forward to hearing more from uh, the AI Lab through the year. Um, just to remind everybody watching, if you'd like to put your questions to Indra, there's some great ones coming in already. Um, you can go to bit.ly slash Slido DB16. Of course, do be aware that Indra can't answer questions about the entire NHS and the health system. Uh, so please do try to keep them to um, AI and the 
the AI lab, and I'm sure Andrew would be delighted to answer them. So let's start with the first question that we've got. Um, so question from Joe Turnbull. Uh, good evening to you, Joe. How has COVID-19 changed your approach to AI? I think I would answer that in a slightly different way in how has COVID-19 changed our approach to digital transformation. I always see AI as a layer on top of digital transformation. And what we've seen over the last nine to 12 months is a real shift both in mindset of what we call commissioners, so people paying, but also the public and the clinicians in the healthcare sector to actually receive and be real more receptive to digital transformation things like remote monitoring devices, I talked about some of those, and um, about collecting data for both operational as well as, as, well as clinical perspectives, and also um, the ability for digital and remote to actually reach people who might not be hard to reach, uh, don't mean hard to reach, who are difficult to reach. And so that remote consultation as well has really seen a big change. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Lewis Price as well. What safeguards are in place to prevent CSC and um, DXC technologies from the misuse of data acquired through their support provider to the NHS? And I suppose there's a broader question there about how you sort of manage that sort of relationship with any private provider. Yeah, I mean, procurement in the NHS is a, is a slightly complex, if, uh, if kindly said, um, process. And within it, there are a number of both safeguarding, but also requirements and standards within those frameworks. And we work very closely with both the commercial teams and um, the procurement teams to make sure that the standards we're developing are embedded in that. And I talked a little bit earlier about regulation. If your product is a medical device or it works with healthcare data, then again, there are where our healthcare regulators are very often involved in that whole process as well. So if you're doing a research project, if your platform is about research, or if it's a product working with patients, again, those regulators have those safeguards in place. Thanks. We've got some great questions coming in. I must say, I think they're all from men so far. So if we could up the diversity of the questions, that would be brilliant. Um, Anonymous, uh, a long time uh, Data Bytes attendee, asks, how does NHS X AI link with NHS England and NHS digital data work? We're all one big happy family is the short answer. Um, it's always very difficult when you're from the outside trying to understand which each letter of the NHS does. But in essence, NHSX is both a delivery and a policy arm. And so what we try to do is we're both jointly NHS England and improvement employees, as well as Department of Health employees. So we join up together and we work very closely with NHS Digital on delivery as well. If I could squeeze a question in there as well, are there other sort of data labs or AI labs across the rest of government or the rest of public sector that you have any relationship with and sort of how do you work with them? Yeah, we work with a number of um, both labs and departments, etc. Um, naturally, we have a very close relationship with the Office of AI. We work closely as well with the diff um, with ONS in um, some of the work being related to the pandemic. We've worked closely with the MOD in the past. They also have a data a data lab. So we're always open to to the party. If people find that we've not quite reached out to them, please do, and vice versa, we'll we'll reach out as well. Excellent. Uh, next question is from Simon Worthington, former presenter at Databytes. How do we make AI ethics and safeguards explainable to individual patients to keep them feeling safe about the use of their data? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something we're exploring both from a patient perspective, but also from a clinician perspective to help them feel confident that the product they're explaining, they feel trust in. So we're working with HEE around that. We've got a programme of work and embarking on that. But on the flip side, what we're also trying to do is make this really tangible, is working with our AI awardees. So each awardee um, has what we call a patient participation involvement group. So where we bring patients together and actually help them understand what the product is its development life cycle and how it really affects them. So it's a kind of multifaceted approach that we're taking. We've got just under four minutes left, so still time to get your questions in to Indra. In the meantime, let's go with Hilary. Uh, evening to you. In which areas do you think AI will deliver the greatest benefit for the NHS? The low hanging fruit, that's always the case, isn't it? So, um, 
the excitement is always around clinical diagnostics. People always get really excited about diagnostics and think, oh my God, machine learning can do so much amazing things. But actually, it's very difficult to do that in the clinical setting. And so we're quite, um, we've seen so far some very good advances in the operational side. And I don't think I'm saying anything new to a lot of colleagues here listening in, but you know, operational back-end processes. Yes, AI can do some quite good and what we call low-hanging fruit, speeding up some of the mundane tasks, looking at patterns and big data sets. You know, some of this stuff is um, well known. So healthcare is no different in that aspect. On the flip side, I do say clinical diagnostics are exciting. What AI can do, and we've seen it start doing, is do things that the human eye can't do. So, for example, when you look at an image, and what I mean by an image is, say, the image at the back of your eye or an image of your lungs, um, machine learning deep methods can quite often capture or look at what we call pathology, things going wrong that the human eye can't. And that, in essence, will require some time to get all the, the products up to market speed. But that's a really exciting space as well. Excellent. We've got around two minutes left. Questions are still coming in. Um, so question from YouTube user Flowers Lions. Hello to you. Is data helping to monitor return on investment of your supply chains? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? I'll be really honest and say I'm not entirely sure. It's difficult to answer that question because a lot of um, investments are sometimes made at a local or regional level. And whilst we will capture that nationally, it'll may take a bit of time. So I'd probably say watch this space. Excellent. Um, I think we've probably got time for two more questions. So Chris asks, are you looking at building new models for enabling innovators to access sensitive data, uh, for instance, using data trusts? So this is a good question. And we look at lots of different models of accessing data where we do have a data strategy coming out. So do look out for that. Um, we also work very closely with HDR UK, Health Data Research UK, who have various models and also have what we call an innovation gateway, which allows um, researchers to access or at least know where different data sets are. So um, it also also depends on the use of what you want to do with that data, of which then ethical and um, research regulations may be applicable. Excellent. Uh, we heard from HDR UK in our July 2020 event, if anybody wants to watch that back. And I suppose the NHS data strategy might be an excuse for another sea shanty. Um, final question from Alistair Vetch. If there's one thing you would want to do next, what would it be? Oh, I'm assuming that is work related, Alistair. So I will be professional <laughs> versus looking at the timings. Um, I would say the next real big step we have is instilling confidence in people with the products that they're seeing and that are out there. People often talk about the potential of AI. What we've seen now is there are actually some really good products that are there and how we both build the trust in those products and help deploy them into that care pathway, clinical setting, operational setting. So that's my next and our next ambition. Fantastic. Indra, that's been a terrific introduction to the work of the AI, AI Lab. We look forward to hearing more from uh, the lab throughout the year and thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, everyone. So our next speaker is the first of our Jameses this evening, uh, James Tucker. James, over to you. Thanks very much for the intro and thanks so much for inviting me to present today. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to present at my uh, first Data Bytes. So I'm going to be talking about um, building a data quality culture in government. And um, just to start off with, I want to um, look at the term culture. And um, I'm working with this definition here that's um, a set of shared values, goals, attitudes and practices that characterise an organisation. So while that's a really useful definition of culture, I think anyone who works in an organisation has heard the term, we need a culture change at some point. But without any um, substance behind that or understanding of what that means in context, it can be quite an unhelpful term and sometimes just used as a uh, description of a problem that's too big to solve. So um, for our work on data quality, we've really set about um, sort of unpicking what that means and um, how um, culture applies to the way um, government departments um, address data quality. 
So looking at, at that in a bit more detail, um, I think that um, the top um, issue um, that we've come across is that data quality isn't always seen as a priority. It can often be seen as a sort of a backroom task or something that's done um, at the very end of um, the data life cycle when data is analysed and used. And also um, when, when it comes to recognition of the importance of data quality, it often doesn't come into the limelight until there's been some sort of error or poor decision made with the data. So linked to this, um, that can mean there can be a tendency to tolerate and work around poor quality data and only to fix problems once they've um, once they've arisen. So that tends to result in a sort of unhelpful kind of um, elastoplast fix to data quality issues. Um, picking up also on the um, fourth point on that slide, I think this is an issue that's common across uh, large organisations and in government we're doing, dealing with so many different departments with um, kind of their historical ways of, uh, of processing and managing data that we do have a, a lot of inconsistent approaches and lack of knowledge sharing in departments which does really impede what we're trying to do with data across government and realise the benefits um, of the national data strategy. So all this is taking place against a backdrop of um, a huge increase in the volume and sources of data. I think um, everyone's heard the term data revolution and these uh, new sources of data, new ways of collecting, new ways of analysing all throw up quality issues that perhaps uh, we're not familiar with. Um, so, for example, big data sources can be very different to uh, survey data collections. So once we sort of unpacked that uh, concept of data quality culture, we were able to develop a data quality framework for government, which is uh, strap-lined towards a data quality culture. And you can see a link there to the publication that came out at the end of last year. So um, what we wanted to achieve with this was not a checklist or a tick box exercise where um, uh, practitioners and leaders would work through and tick, tick off um, against various criteria. We wanted to produce something that was principle based and really um, encourage people to think and uh, think creatively about how they manage data quality and really to encourage that sort of intellectual contribution to this work. So just picking up on a couple of these principles, um, I think the first one there is, is about commitment to data quality and that uh, the, the motivation for this really has to come from the uh, most senior levels in organisations. And I think the way to generate that is to really tie in the importance of data quality into a department strategic objectives. And that then makes it really tangible for people. Because so I think data quality um, by itself can come across as maybe quite a nebulous term, um, something that sounds quite general. Um, and then also, um, I think uh, I mentioned in a, a minute ago about um, data quality often being only considered the end of the pipeline. So um, we want to encourage um, a data quality culture right across the data life cycle. And by that, I mean um, understanding how um, everything from data collection, um, people on the front line collecting the data, um, through to how it's processed and then used, they all have an impact on whether that data is fit for fit for its intended purpose. Um, again, um, I think we need to make sure we communicate data quality clearly, especially important, um, really highlighted during the pandemic. We're seeing more sharing of data between departments and it's absolutely vital that um, the recipients of data understand the limitations and how it can meet their purposes. Um, so thinking a bit more about what exactly is data quality, um, I think the best way to think about it is fitness for purpose. Um, it's tempting to say that we want to have high data quality, but that isn't really too helpful because um, you don't always need data to be absolutely gold standard. It has to be fit for its intended purpose, and that might mean some sacrifices in accuracy for or timely data, for example. So the way we've conceptualised this in our data quality framework is around a set of data quality dimensions that were developed by the Data Management Association, who we collaborated closely on with this work. And uh, this provides a way of framing data quality. So you can see there there's various facets of it, um, in including timeliness being an aspect. So you might be um, uh, if you want if you want data instantly to meet a particular policy need, you might be prepared to sacrifice uh, a bit of accuracy in favour of that timeliness. 
So something that we became conscious of as we were developing this framework was that um, it's not sufficient just to produce a framework or a guidance document or a policy. It does need that momentum and traction behind it. So that's when we developed a plan to um, uh, develop a government data quality hub based at the ONS. And to wow. our um, joy and to be honest, a slight amazement, we got uh, funding for this in the spring budget. Um, last year um, and since then we've been working hard to roll out this service across government. So basically the government data quality hubs work can be divided into two main areas, one being sort of set, setting direction and incentivising improvement. But the really important part is um, providing support to government departments, building that community, providing the tools, techniques, training and guidance that people need to do data quality well. Um, so the service is currently being rolled out. We're, we're fully staffed now, I'm um, pleased to say. So, um, and we're working with a range of government departments on improving their data quality already. So just expanding a little on the incentivising improvement part. Um, I think it's really important to, for departments to know where they need to get to. Um, so um, I think uh, this takes us to where we actually want to be in government. So um, we want to be committed to assessment improvement of data quality and have some shared goals and approaches and collaborative networks that really enable us to be prepared for new data quality challenges like we've seen in the uh, pandemic. Lastly, I'll touch on a, another way we're in, um, looking to provide an incentive, and that's uh, I'm a big fan of uh, data maturity models. And this provides a framework for departments to understand where they're at in data capability and where they want to get to. And we're hoping that through working on this, we can progress departments through those maturity scales, really reduce the risks associated with data quality and ultimately produce data that can be used for much wider range of purposes. So that's a very a quick tour of what the work we're doing in the Data Quality Hub. We're really, really keen to hear from anybody with an interest in this area from inside of government or outside. So please do get in touch um, at any of those contact points there. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, James. And uh, another one perfectly sticking to the time. Um, brilliant. So um, we're already getting some fantastic questions in, but a reminder, if you'd like to put a question to James, uh, James you can do so using bit.ly slash Slido DB16 with a capital S and a capital DB. So let's start with a great question from Anonymous. How do you see data quality gaining traction in an increasingly agile delivery world where data quality can be seen as the washing up? Yeah, that, that's that's an excellent question. I think this comes back to the um, the whole life, whole data lifecycle approach and uh, to think of data quality holistically rather than being just something that's dealt with in, uh, in, um, in one part of that process. So I think through um, instilling that approach, then we can get data quality to be considered throughout that, um, that journey. Um, another um, helpful way of connecting all these things is a, a technique called uh, reproducible analytical pipelines that are essentially a way to um, take it for the data from the data source right through to the analysis and onward use of the data in a fully auditable and transparent way. So through having that as a thread that runs through that data lifecycle, we're then able to um, provide a sort of method for data quality that everybody can understand. Brilliant, thank you. Um, We've got the next question from Miranda Sharp, who's previously presented at Data Bytes. Evening to you, Miranda. How are you measuring and specifying appropriate data quality? Um, I think that depend uh, the the specifying data quality. I think I'll um, I go back to m m the point I made about fitness for purpose. So um, there's a technique called um, data quality action planning, and it's something that we advocate in our um, data quality framework, which essentially starts off with the um, the purpose of the data. So hypothetically, that might be managing future flood risk. And from, from there, you can identify the critical data that enables you to meet that purpose. And then a step further, you can then identify what you need to measure and what targets and criteria you need to set around that measurement. So I'd say that it is highly context dependent, but this um, data quality action planning method provides a way of framing it. 
Thanks. I'll ask a related um, question next. And it actually goes to something that came up in our previous data bytes um, from Chris at Highways England. Um, James Cutler asks, what approach do you use to value the data you collect to support necessary investment in your data infrastructure? And do those succeed? That's a good question. One I, I don't know the full answer to. I know there are there is work underway to understand the value of data in government. Um, I think I'd need to talk to some economist colleagues about that. Um, also, there's a project in the United Nations as well that's looking at across countries. I think um, um, sort of related to value, I, I'd, I'd say that it's important to be able to translate um, what data quality means or data assets mean in relation to the strategic objectives of the organisation. It doesn't work to simply say we need to make our data better. Um, it needs to have uh, that reason to get the traction behind it. Excellent. So um, let's go to Ruth Dixon next, evening to you, Ruth. Um, how do you balance the value of long-term consistent data series with responsiveness to new measures and requirements? Something I know Ruth has done a lot of work on in the past. Yeah, um, I think with uh, um, with time series, yes, there there is, is always value in having that consistency. And I think, um, you know, in, in the pandemic as well, we've obviously seen sort of differences in the way uh, survey data is collected and things like that. And there are method methodologies to enable us to get a sort of a consistent view over time. Um, I'd say that um, so there, there are approaches to dealing with this where you can introduce new series um, and, and sort of dual run them alongside in um, the uh, previous methodologies that enable them the two to be linked together into a coherent time series. But yes, I think there is always that tension between providing the best possible data versus uh, um, that meets the current need versus uh, something that is consistent over time. So we've got another question from Flowers Lions uh, next. Do you think that the way ONS lays out the data could be clearer for the average person to be able to understand? So I suppose there's quite an interesting set of questions that comes out of the, the quality of data visualisation as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's always room for improvement in how data is communicated. I think uh, one challenge is to make the uh, that with the demand, increasing demand for for raw data. I think ONS has made sort of big inroads into making that data available. I'm sure there's always room for improvement. Um, and um, a data visualization team of um, there, I, 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 I'm really impressed by, by how they try to sort of push the boundaries of innovation in data viz and. Um, especially during the pandemic, they produce some really useful and engaging products. But, you know, that, that's not to say there isn't room for improvement in the way we present our data. I think there's always new audiences and always new ways of reaching them. That flows quite nicely into our next question from Nick Mort. What sort of roles do you have within your team to support this work and take it forward? Um, yes, so um, the the um, one of the great things about the data quality hub is that we're building on a service that was already operational for the government statistical service. So unsurprisingly, ONS's focus up to that point had been just on statistics. So we had um, a, a sort of tried and tested, tested set of approaches for working with departments um, and techniques to for improvement. So really our task has been to apply this to a much broader community of um, that's involved in all government data. Um, not just uh, that feeds into statistics. So our approach to do that has to be to build um, a multidisciplinary team and the main focus of recruitment has to bring been to bring in a wider set of expertise of on from with, of data specialists. So now, for example, we have a data scientist in the team, various um, people with a, a long um, and a deep experience of data management and data quality techniques. So it's been great to have something to build on, but definitely been um, a, a, um, needed attention to make it uh, available to that wider audience as well. Fantastic. Thank you. We've got under a minute and a half left, so I'm going to apologise now to people whose questions, excellent questions, I'm not going to be able to get to. Um, <clears throat> we've had a couple of questions around real time data. Um, so Chris asks, is what you're doing applicable to real time data, which is increasingly used to support decision making? And um, again, Flowers Lions, I think, asks, do you think in 2021 we will get to real time data? So how are you approaching real time data? 
that's a really good question something that is on our on our mind to think of i think we have got a lot of work to do on um the the uh sort of more traditional types of government data but as you say real-time data is increasingly used to, in decision making and it's certainly something that we should be considering in the future thank you for that i'm going to squeeze one final batch of questions in which is about working with others um Ryan Dunn um, asks, how will the Data Quality Hub work with GDS in iterating the service manual for teams building digital services and data sources? And Emma Gordon asks, in the context of Indra's work with NHS data, what suggestions do you have for stats people reaching back through different organisations to improve data quality? And I think we've also got another question from Alistair and how better to integrate OGD data, for instance, with Bayes and DWP. So, yes, how are you sort of approaching working with others and particularly GDS and the service manual? Yeah, um, I think um, uh, that's one of the so good things about the uh, funding of the last set of data initiatives in the spring budget is that um, there was a selection of data initiatives funded at that point, one being Data Quality Hub, um, another being the Data Standards Authority um, in GDS. So we work very closely with that team um, in GDS because um, I think we do have our sort of distinct areas. Um, data standards is very much about the interoperability of data sources and having common identifiers, metadata standards, etc. Whereas data quality does uh, encompass much more of the human component and um, uh, sort of broader aspects of uh, of use of data. So um, I think at, um, at the moment we we work closely with GDS on the production of the data quality framework. Something um, integrating with the tech code of practice and the service manual is something that's on our to, um, on on our radar for um, um, for the next for the next year or so. But um, at the moment we thought it important to get our data quality framework out there and being used, and um, then we can think about how it could be integrated. In terms of working more more widely with others, I think there is there are so many data initiatives going on at the moment. This is partly what motivated us to call ourselves um, a data quality hub. But we're very much about reaching out to those other organisations and trying to, to bring it all together rather than ca carving out our own um, so you know our own separate niche. Um, I think we're very much a convener of people with expertise and interest in data quality as well. Thanks, James. And apologies to all of those of you who asked fantastic questions that I wasn't able to put to James. James, nonetheless, that's been an incredibly useful introduction to one of the most important data initiatives in, in government at the moment. I'm sure we'll hear from you again in the future as work develops. But for now, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me on, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks. So now we move on to our third speaker, which is Lisa from Ordnance Survey. Good evening to you, Lisa. Hi, good evening to you all. Right, so hopefully you can see that now. We can indeed. Excellent. Um, okay, so um, thanks for having me here today. So um, I'm the head of data and analytical services at Ordnance Survey, and I look after the team of location data experts. And what we really do is to make sure our data is fit for our customers today, but also tomorrow. And I think we all know, and we can all hear it, that there's a data revolution going on at the moment, isn't it? And it's transforming almost every part of everyone's lives. Um, I think with this comes huge opportunities, but it also comes some risks on huge risks actually in places. So it means that we have to really manage our data to ensure that we can trust it. So today I'm going to talk to you about ordinate, ordinate surveys and use of data principles to help us look after our data. Okay. So I'm going to start off by um, just telling you a little bit about ordinate survey for those who don't know. So um, we were a government owned company and we supply um, data through um, the public sector geospatial agreement to the whole of government. Um, we're over 200 years old. You can imagine some of the legacy that comes with that. Um, but we have to keep evolving to stay relevant. And we manage one of the key national data assets for Great Britain. So what does that look like? What do we mean by that? Well, we make 20,000 changes um, a day to a database that contains over 500 million geographical features. That's anything from a building, a care home, or um, a road, and many, many more. Um, and our data is used by 5,000 um, government users, where it's free to use. And we launched our new APIs to um, the public sector in January this year through the Data Hub. But you can also get it commercially. It's also available for our partners. Um, and we've also got open government licensed data, like the unique property reference um, um, data. 
So you might not know it, but you probably have relied on our data. For example, if you've called an ambulance, then um, it might our data might have helped it get to you. Or if you've used um, your car to navigate, well, your sat to navigate, um, you might have used it in that or when you bought a property. So I think it underpins so much and um, many people don't know about it. So what is our data mission then? So we really want um, our customers, because it's relied on so many, to be able to um, trust, find and use our data. So when we think about trust, I think trust is one of those fundamental things because our data is connecting through to a really wide ecosystem. Um, we want to make sure that we protect and secure our data and that it's governed and managed and that we're also meeting all those legal, regulatory and ethical requirements of us. We also want to make sure that um, everyone can find it because there's no point making all this great data actually if people can't find and understand what the data it is. So we need to make sure that we describe um, our data so it's easy to find and discover. And lastly, we want to make sure that it's used, really, so we can deliver improved um, outcomes. So our data that is useful, usable and used um, and make sure that it's accessible to maximise its reach. And um, it's standardised and ready to link. So combined with greater uh, with other data sets for greater um, insights and understanding. So the biggest challenge for us is, um, you know, with our 200 year legacy, we've come from a mapping where people have um, wanted to print it out on paper maps where we are today where actually it's part of a data ecosystem and so it's a very different offering. So how do we go um, about looking after our data? So we have our um, data principles so I'm just going to run you through these and we've developed these data principles and they align quite um, nicely under the um, FAIR um, principles you know the findable, accessible, interruptible and reusable these for us are just a bit more of a drill down so we can make sure it can help us manage our location data as well as our um, corporate or business data, you know, like finance and HR, those sorts of things. Because we want to make sure we're mitigating the risks and also maximising the opportunities to ensure we have that world class data. So I'm just going to run you through these now. So firstly, our data meets our customer needs. I think we can all agree with that one. Um, it means we, we work closely with our customers to understand their use and, and their use cases so we can tackle their problems. Um, we want to be making sure we're listening to their feedback and to work with them for innovative, um, innovative solutions for tomorrow. And we're doing this right now actually as part of the public sector geospatial agreement. So we're working with our customers to hear what they want from our data and how it can be better. And this is really putting the customer at the heart of what we do. Um, the next one for us is that our data is cared for. This, is, this principle is about treating data as, as though it's our own. Um, as custodians of some of Great Britain's best location data, we have to make sure that we protect it and nurture it. It's also about recognise it as a valuable asset and looking after it to ensure that it gets the time, resources and prioritisation it needs and making sure it delivers the outcomes we want. I think the value of this throughout the pandemic, we've seen at the forefront of everybody's minds um, and especially um, in OS where we've um, seen how our data has been used to respond to the pandemic. And I think it's really shone a light on people caring for their data and the rigour that's required to have trusted data. So the next one is about um, secured and protected. So this principle is about protecting our data to reduce the risk of it being exploited or damaged. So it's either inadvertently or those with malicious intent. So it's about protecting the individual's right to privacy and protections and includes a range of measures focused against cyber, physical and personal threats. But from ensuring that we can transfer the data and how to deal with sensitive data as well and the best approaches. And I think this is one that all these policies and principles around this one, it really fits into um, the trust agenda. And I think that's really high on people's thoughts right now to make sure that that data is trusted. So our next one is that our data is governed and managed. And this is about taking a holistic approach to our data governance and management. It's about maximising efficiency and ensuring we're compliant, um, but it's aligned across the organisation, again, to make sure we're meeting those legal, regulatory and ethical requirements. But there's a balance here between the need to control with the need to innovate too. So it's how we consider that to ensure that the projects consider um, data governance right at the beginning and they look at these principles before they even start. So for us, before a project starts, we like them to go through all the rules that sit under our policies and processes and say where they're compliant and where they're not. And if they're not, we'll have a discussion about it. So it's about putting those standards right up front, not retrofitting them. So our next one is um, data is authoritative. So we have over 225 years experience providing geospatial data and we hold some of the most trusted geospatial data. So 
with that, we need to make sure that actually that um, what that data shows is um, where we understand the quality of it. And if like through the pandemic where people ask for different data, actually where it needs to be improved and what we need to do about it. So that comes on to our data is easy to find. So there's no use producing all this great data if people can't find it. And that's internally too. So we're cataloging our data and we're um, publishing our metadata and ways to help people find it. And we're working with the Geospatial Commission actually to take on board the learnings that we've done on the data discoverability project. So you'll see some um, things coming out from us in this area as we, we learn, take those learnings and really make sure our data is easier to find. So data is accessible. So we want to share our data to make sure we're maximising its reach and its impact and enable an economic growth and social and public good, while enable us again to be within the legal and commercial constraints. That means we need clear licensing arrangements so who can access it. It also means we need to understand the impact if we build other people's third party rights within our data and that impact on our sharing it. And then we have easy to maintain. So we want to create products um, and services that are easy to maintain because for us, um, we um, so many people use our data and if um, we make changes, then it impacts on so many. So we need to really make sure we're considering the customer and that when we are making those changes, those knock-in impacts are considered because our data is core reference data. And then that lastly brings me on to our data is standardized. So we want to make sure that it's linked and shared and that um, it fits into that wider ecosystem. So because each one of these principles then has um, policies and processes that sit beneath them, and it's the way that we manage our assets. So I think for me, it comes down to that if you manage the data asset, then um, you can maximise huge opportunities. But if you don't manage it, then there's risks associated with it. And for us, with so many users out there, both in the private and the public sector, it's something we can't get wrong. So this is how we use the principles to make sure we're managing our data. OK. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, a reminder that if you'd like to put a question to Lisa, you can do so using Slido. That's bit.ly slash Slido DB16, capital S, capital DB. Um, I'm going to kick off with a, a question from, from me. And thank you very much for laying out all of those um, really helpful principles. How do you translate? Or how do you make sure that those principles are translated into practical action? What sort of you know, tools, guides, so on and so forth do you have to, to help people that work for you to make something of them? Yeah, so we do a number of ways. So, so for each one of those principles, we list out the policies that sit beneath them. So, for example, there'll be a number that sits beneath secured and protected. And um, when you see those, you realise actually there's quite a lot of them. So what you then have to do is translate them into the rules that you're pulling out of them. So for our project managers, we have um, a form that takes secured and protected all the rules and then they can apply that to their project. So they can look to see if they're complying with each one of those and the areas they need help. So I think it's about how you take that practically, but it's also a really good way of summarizing it because what you'll see is there's some areas where you'll have excessive amounts of policies that actually nobody can comply with. And then you'll need to also then look at when the machines can help you. So if you um, can see things that you can inbuilt into IT, then that's one of the ways of doing it. I mean, it's, it's a bit like health and safety, isn't it? They, they don't say to people when they're walking up the stairs, you know, keep away from the edge. They put a handrail on them. So if there's anything you can build in with IT, you know, like with the passwords or anything like that, the protection, that makes it automatic, that helps. Thanks, Lisa. Next question is from Anna Powell-Smith, another former Data Bytes presenter. Evening to you, Anna. How does Ordnance Survey define customers and what type of customer does OS work with? Oh, that's really a wide one. Um, so we obviously have our um, uh, commercial customers. We have our partners, so our resellers who are uh, reselling our data for us. And then we also have our public sector um, users. So we have the different customers across that piece. Um, there was a debate whether we should have internal customers too, but I think for me, I look, I look outside the organisation. Thanks. Um, another one which sort of goes to the first question a bit from Nick Mort, who says, great presentation. Could you give examples of the sorts of policies that are associated with the data principles at OS? Yeah, so if to um, make your data easy to find, we obviously have a metadata policy. And that is talking about discovery metadata. Um, for other ones like um, Govern and Manage, we talk about um, our um, information asset owners. And we also talk about our groups, our governance groups. So that just gives you a flavour. 
I know, I know Nick's going off to HMRC. So if you want some examples of the policies, I'm more than happy to share with the examples we've got. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Anonymous uh, now, which is a bit more challenging, um, who says the previous OS chief executive um, was moved on after undermining the government's vision for open geospatial data. How have things got better since? Um, they ask, is OS culture irretrievable? Um, so I suppose that's um, a question that I know comes up a lot with the Ordnance Survey, which is your sort of approach to open data in particular. Yeah, so I think um, we released our open UPRNs um, and USRNs, so unique property reference number um, and, um, and the streets last summer. So I think that shows there's there's some progress in there. I know probably people would want more um, from OS. And I think there's always a difficult balance, isn't there, between um, the amount that it takes to collect the data and the open side of things, and also the um, licensing. So I've only been at OS three years, and previous to that, I was in DEFRA, where I led for the Environment Agency, the big open data campaign, and then I was in DEFRA. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm aware of all those, but I think there's a, there's a tricky balance. It'll be interesting to see how things play out. Excellent. Um, we've got about four minutes left, so still plenty of time for people's questions to come in. Um, we've got a question uh, again from Flowers Lions on YouTube. Very specific one. Do you have data on charities as part um, of your sort of data sets? Oh, that's a difficult one. So are you thinking, because we have like care homes and supermarkets, are you thinking where the charities are? Um, so they, they sort of say specifically, do you have data on charities as part of the public sector? So I suppose it's in particular oh, with the, uh, things like care homes, I suppose, where it's involved in public service delivery, maybe. So I think if it's sharing with the public sector, I don't. the charities don't come under that part, do they? Because they're third sector, so they wouldn't be available as part of that. Um, but... Yeah, it depends if the question's about the um, within our data ourselves or who we supply to. So I think, yeah, we um, they don't come under the public sector because I think they're the third um, sector. But um, yeah, I can check. Always, you can always come back to me because obviously customer first. If we can do anything, let me know. You can always contact me on Twitter. Thanks. Um, how generally applicable do you think um, your principles are across government? Are there things that are specific to geospatial and the other types of data that you work with? Um, or do you think they could be picked up by lots of other different organisations? I think they can be used by lots of other organisations. So um, I, I'm, I'm always one of the in, in, in ordnance survey says that geospatial is not that special when it comes to data. You know, how you manage data is how you manage it. Sometimes you get different flavours, you know, you, the, the personal data you manage in a different way to some of the geospatial, but that, but mostly a lot of this stuff you can apply across the piece. So you'll see that DEFRA, we did some data principles and there's tweaks on it. I think what does change is context. So you might want to emphasize, so for Ordnance Survey, we've emphasized the authoritative because that's, you know, we've got all those hundreds of years worth of experience and we supply the whole of um, government with, with geospatial data. So I think that one we pull out, but actually the rest of them, I think, um, uh, lots of organisations can use private and public sector. Thanks. We've got a question now from Dan Klein. Uh, good evening to you, Dan. Um, good presentation, Lisa. How is OS improving its usability, usability to be comparable to OpenStreetMap? Oh, we're doing some work at the moment. So the public sector geospatial agreement, we're getting all that feedback. So what is it that um, people um, are, are causing them friction? So some of the stuff we're looking at at the moment is... Um, that if you want information, say, on a building, you have to go to multiple products to try and get that information. We're doing a big transformation where we're bringing together like all the attributes together. So then people will be able to choose what they want. And um, we're also looking at formats and things like that and APIs. So we're, yeah, ears are open to how people would like to use our data better and those points of friction. Thanks. We've got a question from Alistair Vetch, who says he loves the data is cared for. Um, with this in mind, have you noticed an uplift in trust or confidence in the data? Or has this always been good? Um, I think it, it comes up more on the agenda. So I think as an ordnance survey, we were a data company. So I think for us, everybody talks about data, even HR and finance. 
Um, so that's quite amazing. So I think has it improved trust? I think um, it's meant that we've um, linked into the information asset owners and made sure we've got those in place and been sitting down with them and talking to them. We've always been really focused on quality as far as trust is concerned. Um, so that that hasn't changed because I think that's just within us innately. Um, so yeah, it's 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 in there and it's in its drip. It's making sure that we were polishing off areas where we were just a little bit weaker, um, but they definitely weren't out of the ballpark when we started. And we've got another 30 seconds or so, so I'm going to squeeze in a final question, which again goes to sort of open data point. Anonymous, thank you again, Anonymous, asks, does the Treasury model of funding cause difficulties for open data? Oh, well, generally. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, for us, um, being a government owned company, we get um, funded through the Geospatial Commission through the public sector geospatial um, agreement. So really the Ordnance Survey is custodians of that data on behalf of government. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not too sure of the treasury model for that one, but it, it depends on what, how people want to um, push open data and, that, and what we need to do as a government overall. Uh, a great point on which to end. Lisa, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And we now have our final uh, presenter of the evening, uh, our second, James, uh, James Coote. Over to you, James. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, hopefully you can see my slide. We can um, indeed. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, well, I'm James Coote. I work at Number 10's data science team. Delighted to be the first person from the team to get to speak here. Um, but I'm actually seconded to number 10 from the Royal Air Force. So I absolutely was not going to miss the opportunity to kick off uh, with a picture of a plane. And of course, in this picture, you can see a cavalryman looking up at that plane in, in 1910. And it's often used to symbolise the danger of fighting yesterday's wars, of, of looking backward rather than forward. And in the context of the government's use of data, I wonder whether you see us as the cavalrymen or the aviators, whether you think we're we're largely engaged in yesteryear's war of words, or whether we're increasingly effective in our decisions driven by data. But whatever your current verdict, I think it's hard to argue that better use of data is what most, at least in government, are aiming for. But I think one of the challenges we have that many have identified is whether we actually have the skills across the whole organization uh, to, to, to reach that. I think we certainly aspire to be airmen, but perhaps some of us still from the, the comfort of horseback. And perhaps that's not surprising, since many of our senior leaders are arts and humanities graduates who, who perhaps haven't had chance to work on their data skills since school. And this isn't imminently going to change when you look at the fast stream we still do take on more humanities graduates than any other degree discipline. Now, I'm absolutely not suggesting we should employ less humanities graduates, nor that data skills are more important than other skills, simply that there's a requirement for data skills and investing in them can provide significant returns. So the question is then, how do we equip our senior leaders across government and senior leaders of the future with the data skills they need? And since joining Number 10 in August, I've made answering this question my, my job, really. First, I had a bit of a look at what was already out there. Now, there's a wealth of content, but some of it was difficult to access. Some of it was great, but other parts of it weren't the most engaging. But none of it really specifically focused on our, on our senior leadership. So at the end of September last year, I teamed up with stakeholders across government, some of which are summarized on the slide to create a targeted online course called the Data Masterclass for senior leaders, covering three topics that we thought were key to leading in government today. Conducting data-driven policymaking and decision-making, communicating compelling narratives through data, and data science and new frontiers. And learning from the previous data upskilling efforts, we defined three design principles, trying to make it unusually accessible from any device, any time, exceptionally engaging, to quote my favorite song, all killer, no filler, and deeply vocational. Uh, so trying to ensure that everything was directly relevant to senior leader, leaders across government's day jobs. And, and we then got to building it in, in 57 rather frenetic days. 
Um, so what does it look like? Unfortunately, there's no shanties in the data masterclass yet, but uh, there's still room for you, Gavin, perhaps for the next round. At the minute, uh, it, it comprises 10 TED style talks from some of the country's best speakers on data. So we had Hannah Fry, who gave us an incredible introduction to the power and limitations of data. We had Sir David Spiegelhalter, who spoke on, on being a data translator and also on trust as well. Uh, Raya Hadsel from uh, the director of robotics at DeepMind, who talked us through the practicalities of running data science projects and a number of experts from within government as well, uh, such as Sir Ian, of course, uh, Tom Smith from the data science campus and Rachel Glenister from FCDO. And complementing each talk, we, we had some case studies of the exemplary use of data from across the civil service. We've, we've heard a few great examples tonight, actually, we might have to add some of those in. We, we, we sort of covered the, the comprehensive evaluation of the Troubled Families Programme to some stuff on data visualisation, particularly looking at how DWP sort of radically overhauled their statistical publications and to how Bayes and other departments have built their data science capabilities, which, of course, a lot of departments are looking at doing themselves. And to add to the TED Talks and the quizzes, uh, and, and the case studies, sorry, there are also quizzes, there were calibration tests of judgment and, and lots of discussions. And the senior leaders involved made over a thousand comments in the last seven weeks. But I guess the killer question is, what did people actually think? So, so far we've rolled out the masterclass in three departments, uh, uh, just for deputy directors and above, and all 200 places went within 90 minutes, which demonstrates the, the hunger the data upskilling that our senior leaders in government have. And when you look at the course dropout rate, that you can see that as of today, 76 of the, of the people who signed up, or about a third, have got all the way through, which I think for an online course with a pretty tough exam at the end uh, is extremely high when you compare it to industry. The overall average rating was 95%, and we had a load of lovely comments uh, I guess the ones that were particularly attractive to us were that it was accessible and relevant to our target audience, despite perhaps being a dry topic for some, sacrilege, uh, that it inspired senior leaders with potential application of data to their day job, and that they asked more and, and hopefully better questions of their departmental analysts. And we think this, this interface between the senior leaders and the departmental analysts, of which there's, of course, 17,000 across government, is really key. So we're not stopping with a small scale pilot. The brilliant data science campus uh, are helping us to create two more difficult levels to, to the masterclass, a practitioner and an expert applied level. And they're gonna take over the masterclass as it aims to upskill over a thousand senior civil servants by spring next year. And we really hope that this is gonna shift the needle across government on our use of data and improve the way we deliver public service. So what messages do I want to leave you with? Well, firstly, that senior leaders across government really want to upskill in data. Spaces from our data masterclass just flew off the shelves, as I said, in 90 minutes. Secondly, that here in the number 10 data science team, we think that cross-government data upskilling is, is really important. And thirdly, that we're putting our money where our mouth is and, and driving the data upskilling agenda forward at pace in partnership with the data science campus and the many others in the government data science community, of which we've heard from some today. So I've ended with this picture back up, and I, I really hope that my talk perhaps has convinced at least one or two of you that when it comes to, to data, more and more uh, of us in government are striving to be the aviator rather than the cavalryman. Thanks for listening. Back over to you, Gavin. Brilliant, James. Thank you very much. I can speak from experience that uh, how to skill up senior leaders in government about data is something that comes up quite a lot uh, when we're talking to people in and around government. And um, I think you may need to uh, turn your camera back on after the um, after sharing your slides. Um, just to remind everybody, we've already got some great questions coming in to James. If you would like to submit any, please go to bit.ly slash Slido DB16. Um, James, I'm going to start with a question from Anonymous, but it's one that I wanted to ask as well, which is, are the TED Talks and use cases uh, going to be open or shared? Will any of the materials be made more widely available? Hey, that's a great question. Um, we'd absolutely love to. And we're in talks with the people who gave the talks to look at which ones we can open up. For probably 50 or 60% of the talks, I think we will be able to open them up. 
uh, and maybe 30 or 40 percent because they're usually paid uh, speakers and they do it for us for, for free because of the audience, which was really, really kind of them to do it. We might not be able to open up some of those, but we're going to do our best to open as many of them as we can. Excellent. I should I should say there are a lot of similar questions. Uh, Satyam says he'd like to steal this for his organize, uh, their organization, uh, a council. Um, so lots of great questions coming in. Um, Anonymous, another one, uh, asks, how data literate would you assess the current crop of senior leaders? Uh, what do you see as the most immediate area to improve? Hey, sure. So um, when we got them to sign up, the senior leaders, uh, we actually asked them to subjectively rate their own data literacy uh, on a scale of zero to 10. And um, the, the result was actually 5.6, uh, in case you're wondering. Um, so, so that's where senior leaders think they are. Um, and to be completely honest, all I can judge from, right, is going through the number of people who successfully completed all the content, then passed the test. And so far, we haven't had anyone who hasn't managed to pass the test within three attempts. And we've purposefully not drilled down into that data too much yet because the purpose of the masterclass is not to bash civil servants over the head with, with whether they're good or bad at data, it's more to, to upskill them. So I, I'll be a bit cautious in sharing that data, but, but actually it's because we haven't analyzed it yet. And secondly, just to come back onto your point before, Gavin, if, if there are other governmental organizations or or arms length bodies, we'd love to hear from them. And if we can share as much of this as possible, even if it's not all of it, then, then, then we will. Some of the content is artificial, so we can't necessarily share it with everyone, the case studies, but if they're government departments, we're looking to scale up in the next couple of months. So delighted to get in touch with them. Fantastic. Um, this sort of follows on from the previous question. Um, Anonymous asks, how did you assess the gap in current senior leaders' knowledge and skills in data to decide the content that was required for the masterclass? Hey, that's also a really, really good question. So there was an internal report which had looked into the technical fluency of senior leaders. So that helped us to some extent, obviously, for, for obvious reasons, I can't share necessarily all the results of that report. But then other than that, we we mainly undertook semi-structured interviews with deputy directors and above and talk to the senior leadership uh, ministers and, and the cabinet secretary of what they saw looking down as they, they, they thought that the areas where we could have the most impact would be. Um, so I wish I could give you some lovely data behind how we actually uh, did all of the quality of research be, behind that, but actually it was um, most of the, the research was qualitative really. Excellent. Um, our next question from Mary Susan Barry, good evening to you, um, flows quite nicely from that, which is, would you agree with Dame Sue Owen that delivery skills along with science backgrounds are overlooked at PermSec and senior civil service level? Oof. I, uh, I don't think I can answer that question. Um, sorry, I would hate to be drawn either way. But um, what I would say is that um, the senior leaders that I've engaged in this, the cabinet office, COO, the, the cabinet secretary, like it's absolutely clear to me that data is very, very high up their agenda. And lots of them are quite humble about the fact that they have a hunger to learn more and they have room for improvement. Um, so so that, that's the response I, I'd, I'd kind of cagely give to that. And sorry, I can't give more. Um, I thought this might be a question that came up and uh, Chris and Hillary have both asked versions of it. Are ministers uh, taking up the data masterclass? Uh, does senior leaders include government ministers? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So at the minute, no minister has finished the whole thing. And that's perhaps understandable when you think that the course is usually taking people about five to ten hours to do. It's quite, that's quite a significant time uh, sort of commitment at the moment, especially since we've run the pilot over Christmas, Brexit uh, and a third lockdown. However, a number have signed up. In fact, um, CDL Michael Gove described it as his Christmas treat. Unfortunately, for obvious reasons, uh, that's verbatim. Um, uh, unfortunately, for obvious reasons, he didn't actually get to take it over Christmas. Uh, but there has been interest at that level. However, no one's actually taken the whole thing. 
feedback has been from from people working either in the private office of ministers or otherwise that um, perhaps if we were to target them, we might need to make it a bit shorter, right? Try and cut it in half or something. And we're trying to work out whether the juice is worth the squeeze at the moment, right? We have to kind of start to scale this somewhere. So we think the, the most fertile grind, ground to scale it is senior civil servants first, because they seem to be really receptive and 33% completion rate's great. And then if there is hunger and there's pull from the ministers, and I think the pull has to come from them because they're not going to have it forced down their throats by me. Uh, if the pull comes from them and they want a shorter course, then hey, we'll, we'll absolutely respond to that need. Thanks. Um, we've got about two minutes left. So I'm going to apologise now to everyone who's asked a brilliant question that doesn't get asked. Um, Anonymous asks, and again, very busy evening for Anonymous, TED style talks are attractive, but do they make a difference? How are you tracking the impact of this material in how these leaders actually acted? Yeah, hey, uh, another great question. Um, so, yeah. So in terms of at the minute, obviously, all I can show you is nice quotes and nice feedback and they're lead indicators rather than lag indicators. I don't think anyone can say we've shifted the needle in government just yet, right, from a, from five or 10 hours of TED Talks and case studies. The way we're trying to formalise the lag metrics uh, without consuming ourselves with things which are quite difficult to measure, right, like whether that's changed someone's behaviour for 100 senior civil servants smattered across the civil service is really difficult. But the way we're trying to do it is these two more difficult levels that we've outlined, the practitioner level and the expert level that I talked about, they ask people who've taken the masterclass to apply those principles to a worked example of a project and then deliver it and give a portfolio of evidence to show they've delivered it. So we're hoping in a year's time when we've implemented these two levels that we'll have a portfolio of projects that are evidence to have come directly from the masterclass, directly attributable, saying these senior civil servants have taken the masterclass and then come up with a great idea for using data or evidence better in their policymaking or operational side of things. And then they've delivered it and we have the portfolio of evidence. So that's what we're trying to do to capture that lag metric. But truthfully, we're never going to capture all of the benefit or disbenefit of, of this. One final question again, sorry to everyone who's asked uh, questions that I've not got round to. Um, Meaton says, Sir Andrew Dilnot was speaking about the failure of the senior civil service to understand statistics more than 15 years ago. What will be different this time? A great question and Sir Andrew Dilnot gave one of our talks um, in the masterclass and, and also cited that, right, he talked about his experience in uh, asking permanent secretaries in the late 1990s uh, simple descriptive statistics questions. Um, so uh, yeah, your question of why will it be different this time? I think whatever answer I give here, you're probably gonna be skeptical until I come back and hopefully present here in Data Bytes in a year's time with some phenomenal evidence of directly attributable data exemplary projects stemming directly from the masterclass. So I'm not actually gonna attempt to clean it. I think it's a great course at the minute, uh, time will tell whether it leads to directly attributable data exemplary projects in government. James, I'm sure we'll have you back um, once there is an evidence base to be able to talk about some of that. Um, thank you very much for a fantastic introduction to the masterclasses uh, tonight. And um, I'm sure lots of people will be in touch trying to get hold of the material. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much for having me, Gavin. So um, I think that's probably one of my favourite data bytes out of the 16 uh, that we've done. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed it as well. Um, a couple of parish notices before um, we go. The main one, I'm just going to share my screen so you've uh, got the details. Um, we will be having drinks virtual drinks um, shortly after this event uh, closes. So please do come and join us, bring your sugar and tea and rum or whatever else you would like to drink. Um, the link is bit.ly slash d16drinks. The password is ifgdb16. Those are all case sensitive. I will keep those on the screen while I continue talking. Um, I'm not going to keep you from the drinks uh, for much longer, although you may have been drinking throughout. I make no judgment. Um, but all that's left for me to say, um, first of all, please do come and join us on the 3rd of March when we're hoping to have the next Data Bytes event. 
if you would be interested in sponsoring um, uh, an event in the series, um, and we can only keep the series going with sponsors, or you'd be interested in speaking at the series or know somebody who should be, please do get in touch with my with me or with my colleague Pratesh Mystery. And all that remains for me to say are some thank yous. Um, first of all, to the team at the IFG, as ever, uh, for doing a brilliant job of making this happen. To all of you for coming along and asking some fantastic questions this evening. And of course, please do join me in a virtual round of applause for our four brilliant presenters tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Hopefully see you at the drinks and hopefully see you next month. <laughs>